A famous pair of concepts in epistemology is that of the a priori versus the a posteriori or the empirical. And one of the questions that epistemologists want to answer is, is there any a priori knowledge? And if so, which knowledge is a priori? Now, in order to understand those questions, we should understand the terms. And so in this video, I will give a definition of a priori and a posteriori. And in order to really clarify what those terms mean, I will also give definitions of two somehow related but not quite identical opposites, the analytic versus the synthetic and the necessary versus the contingent. And then we will also look at the relationships between these terms. Now, I want to start with one little word of caution, and that is that different philosophers don't always use the same terms in the same way, right? Philosophers tend to use terms in different ways. And so I give you some definitions in this video, but if you read any text that talks, for instance, about the a priori or the analytic or the necessary, you've got to make sure that you know what this author means by it. Now, you might think that it's very unfortunate that philosophers have not settled on a like determinate terminology the way that mathematicians apparently are able to do. And there's something to that. But actually, in philosophy, these different definitions of terms are often given for philosophical reasons, right? If you have different philosophical positions, you might think that different definitions of the terms are the clearest, the most perspicuous, and so questions about terminology are, well, not always, but certainly sometimes, real philosophical questions. Okay, but it means you've got to be careful when reading philosophers to check what they mean with their terms. That said, I'm going to move on to the definition of the a priori that I will be using in this series of lectures. <coughs> so, here's my definition. I will say that something is a priori knowledge if it is knowledge that can be justified without an appeal to experience. So I'm going to say that something is a priori knowledge if it can be justified without an appeal to experience. Okay, let's start with an example, right? Suppose that I claim to know that one plus one is two. And you ask me, why do I believe that? Now, it is very, very unlikely that I will justify my belief that one plus one is two by pointing out some experiences I've had, right? Suppose that I told you, well, look, once I took one apple and another apple and I brought them together and it were two apples. And then I took one tomato and another tomato and I brought them together and it was two tomatoes. So clearly, like using my experience, I came to the conclusion that one plus one is two. Because if that were my justification, you might say, okay, but what if you take one drop of water and another drop of water and you put them together and you get one drop of water, right? One plus one is one. Or you take one rabbit and another rabbit and you put them together and you have 700,000 rabbits. So one plus one is 700,000. You know, all of that seems to be irrelevant. My apples and tomatoes seem to be just as irrelevant as your drops of water and rabbits. How I know one plus one is two is something we can debate, and we will say a little bit more about that in, uh, in another video, but it doesn't seem to be based on experience, right? More on something like rational insight. So that will be an example of a priori knowledge. Knowledge, one plus one is two. Knowledge that can be justified without appealing to experience. Now the word can is important here. It's important here because a priori knowledge can also be justified by appealing to experience. For instance, when you have just talked to an expert. Suppose that you have a friend who is a mathematician and this mathematician tells you that there are infinitely many prime numbers. And you think, oh, okay, there are infinitely many prime numbers. And maybe you don't know the proof yourself, right? So you don't have rational insight, but you still know it, you're justified in believing it, because this expert told you about it. Well, that's an empirical, that's from sense experience, right? Uh, an empirical justification. And so you can have a priori knowledge based on 
empirical justification, a posteriori justification, justification that is through the senses, uh, but it wasn't necessary, right? You could have justified the same belief by not appealing to the senses, but only to your rational insight. So a priori is what can be justified without an appeal to the senses, and a posteriori is what can only be justified through an appeal to the senses. Now, one further thing we should say about that. Sometimes people think that when we talk about a priori knowledge as knowledge that can be justified without an appeal to the senses, uh, what we are doing is we're doing a thought experiment about somebody who has never had any sensation at all, right? And then all kinds of worries might come up. You might think, well, but if somebody doesn't have any sensation, has never had any sensation, uh, are they even able to think, right? Have they been able to learn a language? Can they use concepts? And those are very good questions, but they're not relevant. Because when we talk about the a priori, we're not imagining somebody who has never had any experience. We're imagining somebody like you or me, uh, who has had a lot of experience, has been able to learn a language, is able to think all these thoughts that we are interested in. But now the question is, if you ask them for justification, or they themselves wonder, what is my justification for believing this? Do they have to appeal to specific sensations or not? And if the answer is or not, then we're in the realm of the a priori. Okay, so that's a priori versus a posteriori. Now, as I said, I want to distinguish this from two other pairs of concepts that are maybe linked to it in interesting and important ways, but are not the same. So here's the second set of concepts. It's the analytic versus the synthetic. Now, a priori, a posteriori is about how we can justify things. Analytic versus synthetic is about the grounds of truth of a proposition. What does that mean? Well, if a proposition is analytic, then that means that it's true or false based on just the meaning of the words. So an analytic proposition is true or false based on just the meaning of the words in virtue of the meaning of the terms. It's a phrase one often also hears. Whereas a synthetic proposition is one that is true or false based on something else. For instance, maybe based on the state of the world. Okay, let's give an example. Um, let's take the example, all triangles have three sides, right? That's, that's true. Why is it true? Well, you might be tempted to say it's true because that's just the definition of a triangle, right? The definition of a triangle is that it's a plain figure that is built up out of three straight sides. So all triangles have three sides, right? We don't need to look at the world. In fact, the world is irrelevant. This proposition is true just in virtue of the meaning of the terms. Okay, this proposition is true just in virtue of the meaning of the terms. Now, if I um, give you another example, if for instance I say um, the main square in the city of Utrecht is triangular, well, there's no way that, you know, that that proposition is true or false based on just the meaning of the terms. Right? It's going to be true or false based on Utrecht and its main square and the shape that its main square is, right? Um, which, uh, depending on, on what you think of as the main square, it's probably not triangular. <coughs> so, very important. A priori versus a posteriori is an epistemic or epistemological distinction about ways of justifying things. Analytic synthetic is about where the truth or falsity is coming from, right? Is it coming from just the words or is it coming from the state of the world? Okay, third distinction, necessary versus contingent. So these are what we might term metaphysical terms. Um, necessary means that it couldn't be otherwise, right? It really couldn't be otherwise. I'm going to use a very strong idea of necessity here. If something is necessary, then really there's absolutely no way, even if we change the laws of nature, there's no way that it could be otherwise. 
right? So here's something that's necessary. One plus one is two. That's necessary, right? There's, it couldn't be the case that one plus one is three. That just doesn't even make any sense, right? One plus one is two and it has to be two. Okay, what's something else that might be necessary? Well, um, maybe it's necessary that all triangles have three sides, right? That seems to be necessary. It couldn't be the case that triangles that, oh, look, um, there happens to be a triangle that doesn't have three sides, right? It seems that that, has, that that is necessary. All triangles have three sides. The opposite of the necessary is called the contingent. So something is contingent if it's the case, but didn't have to be the case, right? It could have been different. So um, the fact that I own a Nietzsche bust is contingent, right? I might also not have bought a Nietzsche bust. <coughs> so that's the necessary versus the contingent. Now, I think we can see that there are going to be some quite obvious sort of relations or at least affinities between these concepts, right? If something is a priori, I can know it without experience. If something is analytic, well, that means that its truth is based only on the meaning of its terms, but well, that would seem to imply that I can know its truth or falsity without using experience, right? That all triangles have three sides is true based on the meaning of the terms, but also it's the kind of thing I can know without looking at the world. Um, and it's the kind of thing that's necessary, right? I mean, it has to be the case. And so you might wonder whether these three opposite pairs, these three pairs of oppositions, aren't really at bottom all the same, right? That's a good and serious question. Aren't these terms actually all the same? Now, there's one sense in which they're clearly not the same. They don't mean the same thing, right? I mean, I gave you definitions of these terms and all these definitions were different. The a priori has something to do with how the thing can be justified. The analytic has something to do with what makes it true. And the necessary has something to do with whether it could be otherwise. So they don't mean the same things. But a philosopher might say they could still be extensionally equivalent. And what that means, extensionally equivalent, it would mean that they have the same extension. And that means that they would be true about the same things, right? It's possible that two terms don't really have the same meaning, but they nevertheless are true about the same things, right? Just to give you an example, the coolest object on my desk, the coolest object on my desk, that's one term. Um, my Nietzsche bust, that's another term. They don't mean the same thing, but they are the same thing, right? The coolest object on my desk is my Nietzsche bust. So the terms don't have the same meaning, but they have the same extension. They point to the same object. Now, maybe that's true for the analytic and the a priori and the necessary as well. Maybe everything that's analytic is necessary. Everything that's necessary is analytic. Everything that's, well, and so on and so forth. Well, is that true or is that not true? Let's take a look. There have definitely been philosophers who thought that these three terms meant the same things, but I think it's also fair to say that right now, the sort of orthodox position accepted by almost everyone is that they don't have the same extensions, right? That it's not the case that all these terms refer to the same things. Let's see some examples. So let's start with the analytic and the a priori. If something is based, if something is true, based on the meaning of the terms alone, it's analytic, and it's probably also a priori, right? I mean, you probably don't need experience to justify your belief in it. So if something is analytic, it's a priori, good. But does it also work the other way around? Is, the, is it the case that if something is a priori, it also has to be analytic? Well, there are a couple of kinds of um, exceptions that we might be able to think of. So here's one exception, a famous one. I exist. So this for Descartes is the example of a priori knowledge, right? I exist. I don't need to use my sensory experience to know that I exist, 
right? When I'm thinking, I already know indubitably that I exist. So that seems to be a priori, but it is not analytic, right? It's not part of the meaning of I or the meaning of existence that I exist. That I exist seems to be, you know, something that is based on the world and me being in the world, right? Or me existing. So this seems to be an a priori truth that is not analytic. And by the way, it also seems to be an a priori truth that is not necessary because, well, I also could not have existed, right? If my parents had never met, I wouldn't have existed. So it seems that something can be a priori without being analytic and that something can be a priori without being necessary. Well, here's a second example. I take this example from Kant. When Kant is talking about mathematics, he says, well, you know, take a, a piece of paper, put two points on it, draw the straight line between those two points. Also draw the shortest line between those two points. Kant actually doesn't say it this way, but it comes from his example. Okay, if I tell you to draw both the straight line and the shortest line between the two points, chances are that you'll say to me, look, Victor, that doesn't make any sense. That's the same line, right? The straight line is the shortest line. And I would say, yes, that's right. The straight line is the shortest line. Now, that might seem to be an a priori truth, right? It's, we don't have to sort of do a lot of experiments. We just sort of see through some kind of rational insight that the shortest line and the straight line on this piece of paper are going to be the same. So maybe it's a priori, but it wouldn't really seem to be analytic. I mean, is it part of the meaning of straight that it's short? Is it part of the meaning of short that it's straight? You know, doesn't really seem to be the case. And so Kant at least believes that this is an example of a truth that is a priori and synthetic. Not everybody agrees with that, I should say. But, you know, it's one way of thinking about mathematics. So Kant is also a nice source for the third type of example, because Kant tells us that there are all kinds of um, truths in metaphysics that are a priori and synthetic. And so his own favorite example is that every event has a cause. So Kant believes that it's a priori true that every event has a cause, but he doesn't think that this is true because of the definitions of these terms, right? And if it were true because of the definitions of the terms, it wouldn't be a very interesting metaphysical insight, right? If I have defined an event in such a way that something is only an event if it has a cause, okay, then every event has a cause, but that doesn't tell me anything about the world, right? Because now, whenever I see something, I can't say, oh, something happened, it must have a cause. No, I have to say, oh, something happened. Well, if it had a cause, it's an event. And if it didn't have a cause, it's not an event because that's how I defined the term, right? Kant doesn't define event that way, right? An event is just something that happens. And then we can have the insight, right? The really substantial insight about the world that they're all going to have causes. So I think this is maybe even more controversial than Kant's view on mathematics. Um, but if you go along with Kant, then you have another example of something that is both a priori and synthetic. Okay, so uh, what about the a priori and the necessary? I already gave an example, right? The example of I exist. That might seem to be both a priori and contingent, right? So there are things that you can know without using experience that could have been otherwise. Perhaps even more famously in contemporary philosophy is um, Saul Kripke's argument that there are many necessary truths that are empirical. And so what Kripke thinks is that, um, well, here are some examples. Kripke believes that it is necessary that water is H2O, right? That water has the chemical formula H2O. Well, why is that necessary? Well, he says, because like what a substance really is, right? What its essence is, what makes it what it is, is its chemical formula, right? So water being H2O 
necessarily is H2O. I mean, that's just what water is. It's sort of the identity, the essence of water. If anything had not been H2O, it would also have not been water. Okay, so that's the idea. Water, if it's H2O, and it is H2O, I mean, that's its essence. That's what it really is sort of deep down. And so nothing could be water without being H2O. And so necessarily water is H2O. But of course, at the same time, the fact that water is H2O is empirical, right? It wasn't part of the definition of water. Uh, and so if this type of example works, it shows us that there can be necessary facts in the world that are not a priori, right? We can only know about them empirically. So another example of Kripke said is that he thinks that it's necessary for the identity of a person that they were born from the parents they were actually born from, right? So he thinks that if, if there had been a human being who was like, just like me um, in every respect, except that he had been born of different parents, then it wouldn't have been me. If that's right, then it's necessary that my parents, like my, the people who are my parents are my parents, uh, but of course, again, I mean, this is empirical. You can't know by thinking about the meaning of Victor Geispers who my parents are. Okay, so these kinds of examples, I'm not saying that they are entirely uncontroversial. And, and to be honest, I've sometimes found it hard to wrap my mind around them. Uh, but they've been, they've been very broadly accepted. And so a lot of philosophers have come to believe that there are necessary truths that are empirical and not a priori. Um, and by the way, this at the same time shows that there are necessary truths that are not analytic because none of these truths, water is H2O, it's not analytic, it doesn't have to do with the meaning of the terms. So we could talk about these examples for a long time and in a different kind of course, we might do that. Um, but for now, what I hope to have done is given you some impression of how these terms can come apart of how thinking about the a priori, the analytic and the necessary is not the same thing. In these videos, we will mostly focus on the a priori versus the empirical because that's like the most epistemological of the distinctions, but maybe the other distinctions will also come up, especially for instance, when we think about mathematics.